Acts the 17th chapter and verse 11, the Apostle Paul commends those brethren in Berea because they were more noble than those of Thessalonica because they searched the Scriptures daily, searching the Scriptures to see that that which was spoken was true. I would encourage you this morning to search the Scriptures, to open up your Bibles and to read the verses that we are going to read together. I do not want you to take my word for what God's Word says, but rather I want you to read that word yourself. And I want you to be able to come to an understanding and to a knowledge of the Scriptures that you can live your lives by this morning. A man was sitting next to a woman one night at one of those very fancy banquets. And the woman was dressed very immodestly. She had on a very immodest dress. And the dress that she had on had a very perilously low neckline to it. Now the man did not act as if the woman was not dressed immodestly. But rather he decided that he was going to address it but in his own way. So he took a piece of fruit that was sitting on the table and he gave that piece of fruit to the woman. And the woman was very surprised when he gave that piece of fruit to her. But he explained with a smile and he said, Please, madam, eat of this fruit. For Eve did not know that she was naked until after she had eaten of the fruit. Compare those words in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Beginning in verse 9, when the Bible says, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. And in like manner also, I desire that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but that which becometh women who profess godliness with good works. I want you to contrast those words in your mind for just a moment with this scene. There is an attractive young woman. She is prancing around in very immodest apparel that reveals her undergarments. There is music playing in the background. All eyes are fixated on her, not because of the inward woman of the heart, but rather because of how she has her outward body dressed very immodestly and very revealing. Let me ask you a question. Is this a scene that would take place at some sleazy club in a bad part of town? Perhaps. Is this a scene that you may see in some movie trailer of a vulgar movie that is coming out next week in the movie theaters? Perhaps. Is this some scene that you may see in a pornographic magazine that they try to sell their filth? Perhaps. But it is not. For it is a commercial that has come on TV at 7 o'clock in the afternoon as a family sits down to share a meal with one another. And as they sit and they pray, the TV plays in the background a popular undergarment company as they try to sell their garments to children and to adults. Let me ask you a question. If we are to live modestly in an immodest world, what is at the heart of the issue of modesty that exists within the world? And the answer that I would simply give you is the home. We live in a world today that has become so inundated with the sexualization of various people that has become so inundated with people living very immodest lifestyles and living very immodestly in their manner of life, that some parents have not become able to recognize whether or not their children are dressed modestly or immodestly. And if the adult cannot recognize whether or not the child is dressed modestly or immodestly, you can be certain that the child would not be able to dress whether or not they are dressed modestly or immodestly. You know, immodesty is not an accident. Immodesty is a choice. Immodesty is a choice that begins in the home. Immodesty is a choice that begins and it ends at the feet of desire. But the desire becomes whether or not we want to please God. What is the desire in your heart when you choose to live a life that is whether modestly or a life that is immodest? Is the desire that you're living in your life to please God? Well, therefore, you shall live modestly. 
But if the desire in your life is to not please God, but rather to draw attention unto yourself, then you shall live a life that is immodest. Perhaps you would agree with this statement that it seems that in the world that we live today that the roles in the home that God desired for the home have flipped. In Ephesians chapter 6, beginning there in verse 1, God says that He desires children to be in subjection or into submission into their parents and the rule of their parents as is fitting to the Lord. But it seems in the world in which we live today that those roles have changed. And rather than the child being in subjection to the parents, the parents sometimes appear in subjection to the children. And the question becomes, how can we live modestly in a world of immodesty? You know, the fact of the matter is, we've reached a point in our culture where immodesty is accepted as normal, rather than as immoral behavior and rather as shameful behavior. In fact, many people do not give a second thought to the topic of immodesty. In fact, our young women have been told in the world in which we live that in order for them to be beautiful, in order for them to please others, that they have to dress their bodies in various forms of nakedness and various forms of immodesty. Now the question becomes, what are we talking about? Because as children of God, when we talk about sin, and the Bible makes it very clear that immodesty is sin. When we talk about sin, we do not talk about sin in very vague terms, but rather we talk about sin in very specific terms. So what are we talking about when we talk about immodesty? Well, we're talking about short shorts, we're talking about mini skirts, we're talking about short tops, we're talking about babbling leggings. We're talking about boys who are dressed in very short shorts and very immodest shorts. We're talking about boys who go about without a shirt on in mixed company. We're talking about girls who wear bikinis in mixed company. We're talking about various types of immodesty that have become accepted as normal in the culture in which we live, but they are far from normal, nor are they acceptable in the eyes of God according to the Word of God. You know, there are very few places in which you can go in the world in which we live today where you will not see some form of immodesty. In fact, some have even said that it has entered into the church as a whole, perhaps even in the worship setting. Now, we need to understand there needs to be a greater effort to hearken, that is to hear and to do what God says about modesty and what God's Word commands in regard to modesty so that we can live modest lives in a world of immodesty. You see, some today have become so caught up in the culture of the world that many do not understand what immodesty really is. You know, there was once a story that the Bible told long, long ago about a man who was a king. And this man, he was a faithful king, a man who was loved by God's people, a man who did what God told him to do. But one day, you know, he decided to stay back by himself. And as he stayed back by himself, he went atop his rooftop, and there across the street or down the street from him was a woman who was dressed very immodestly. Perhaps she had no clothing on at all. And she was taking a bath upon her rooftop. And the Bible tells us her name was Bathsheba. She was the daughter of a man by the name of Eliam. And she was the wife of a husband by the name of Uriah the Hittite. And the Bible tells us that this man saw her body that was dressed very immodestly. And lust was sparked in his heart. And as a result of the lust being sparked in his heart, he desired her. His name was David. And we all know how that story goes from that point in time. But I want to ask you a question of inquiry this morning as we begin our lesson on the topic of modesty. And that question is this. Did Bathsheba seduce David directly or indirectly? You know, when we look to the scriptures, there may be various inferences that we can make that perhaps David at least knew of this woman by the name of Bathsheba. We know that Bathsheba, according to 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 39, was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. If you go there in the Bible, you'll see that he was one of David's mighty men. We also know that the father of Bathsheba, his name was Eliam. Well, if you go to 2 Samuel chapter 23 and you read verse 34, you will see that there was a man by the name of Eliam who was located in the bodyguard of David. Now, whether or not this was the same Eliam, we do not know. But if it was, we do know that Bathsheba's grandfather's name was Ahithophel. We've been talking about him in our Bible class as of late. And he was a close counselor to David. 
Now, I think that it would be very hard to assert, given what the Scripture says, that David did not at least know of this woman by the name of Bathsheba. And I think we can all assert, just from simple observance, that Bathsheba definitely knew who David was, for David was the king of God's people. And let me ask you a question. If the president of the United States lived down the street from you or lived right next to you, would you know that the president of the United States lived down the street from you or right next to you? Well, of course you would. Now, here is David, the king of God's people, the most popular man among God's people. Do you think Bathsheba knew that David was living in that house down the street? Yes, she did. Now, what about Bathsheba? Was Bathsheba innocent in all of this? Now, the world would have you to believe that it was not Bathsheba's fault, but rather it was David's fault. After all, David is the one who lusted after Bathsheba. But as you look to the Scriptures, specifically Proverbs chapter 7, and you begin reading there into verse 6, and you go on down through verse 27, you will read a story of that reminds us that if a woman dresses in immodest apparel and exposes her nakedness, and a man lusts after that woman, both the woman and the man play a part in the sin that is being committed. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 7, beginning there in verse 10, this is what the Bible says, And behold, the woman meets him, talking about an immodest woman, the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart, she is loud and wayward, for her feet do not stay at home. Well, what is that verse talking about? That verse is talking about a woman who dresses immodestly, who lives immodestly, and who lives as the world would have her to live. Now, clearly upon that rooftop, Bathsheba was dressed immodestly. She had overexposed her body, and her nakedness was revealed. And as a result of that, thoughts began to brew in the heart of David that eventually David would act upon. Perhaps one could say that Bathsheba liked the attention. Perhaps she wanted eyes upon her overexposed body. Well, that seems to be a theme in the culture in which we live today. In our lesson this morning, I simply want to provide you with three lies. Three lies that the world tells us about the topic of immodesty which do not align with what the Holy Scriptures teach us about the topic of modesty. Lie number one. The world says beauty is found on the outside and not on the inside. Now is it not true that we live in a culture today that teaches our children, especially our young women, that beauty is found in the outward appearance, in the outward body, and not the inward woman of the heart? You turn on your televisions and you're going to see commercials that say this. Buy this specific dress or buy this specific type of clothing which reveals your body and shows off your curves and you will be beautiful. Buy this makeup that covers up your flaws and you will be Buy this diet, begin this diet, start losing weight so you can be skinny and you will be beautiful. The world tells us that beauty is found on the outside, but what does the Bible tell us? Does the Bible tell us that beauty is found on the outside or that beauty is found on the inside? Now I want you to listen to me. If we have taught the daughters of the king that dressing immodestly is what makes them beautiful. If we have taught the children of the king that living immodestly is what makes them cool, then we have failed the king. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning there in verse 8, we find that word modest. Now the word modest is derived from a Greek word that simply means orderly, decent, or as is stated in the word, modest. It's the opposite of another Greek word that we find, which means to be of the world. Now, in the direct context in which Paul uses this word modest, he's talking about the roles of men and women in the church. But in the direct context, Paul is not talking about really the brevity of clothing or the lack of clothing, but rather Paul is talking about the gaudiness or the showiness of clothing. You see, modesty is a two-way street. Yes, it is too low, too tight, and too short. 
But modesty is also living a way which is showy or gaudy, saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. And the attitudes are the same on both sides of the spectrum. Now the world says you got to have the best brands. You got to have those new and improved brands. You got to have the most expensive brands if you're going to be in style. The world tells us you've got to show a little bit of your body if you're going to be in style. But you know, modesty is also a reference to showiness. And the attitude is, look at me, look at me, look at me. When our attitude as New Testament Christians should be, look at him, look at him, look at him. Doesn't Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 say, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify you? No. Glorify your body? No. Glorify your Father who is in heaven. And you know, here's an interesting point about the word modesty. The word modest comes from the Latin term in English which means measurement or standard. So in other words, are we being the measurement or the standard for how the world dresses or is the world being the measurement or the standard for how we dress as New Testament Christians? Well, if we're to be of God, then we need to be the measurement or the standard for God, not of the world. And Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning there in verse 3, we had it read for our scripture reading. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair or of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Peter says that beauty is not the outward adornment of the body. It doesn't mean that you can't be beautiful. It's not to say that a woman is not beautiful. Peter says, let it be the inward person of the heart that is adorned, that is highlighted in your life. In other words, the inner self is of great worth to God. The inner self is of greater worth to God than the outer self. Why? Well, because the outer self wastes away day by day, but the inner self is renewed every single day. Now, I went to high school with girls who dressed immodestly. I went to high school with girls who dressed in very revealing clothing in order to draw attention unto themselves and unto their body. But that was never my focus because I was always focused at a girl at church. This girl, she was beautiful on the outside, but her beauty was not merely outward. Her beauty was adorned with godliness on the inside. I married that girl. That girl is going to be the mother of my child. And I never had to worry about her dressing immodestly. In fact, she went out of her way not to dress immodestly because her priorities were with God. Now, you may disagree with this, but I wholeheartedly agree with this. If somebody dresses immodestly, I can tell you where your priorities are. They're not with God. They are with the world. Now, Let's talk about this for just a second because this is a question that is of great importance when we are dressing our bodies. If a person dresses in immodest apparel, the question becomes, well, why are they dressing in immodest apparel? The question that you need to ask yourself every single morning when you clothe yourself with kindness, with long-suffering, with godliness, with those traits that are characteristic of Christ, when you clothe yourself with those things every single morning, you also need to take into account the motives of why you are clothing your body in certain things. And if you are clothing your body in immodest ways in order to draw attention unto yourself, then you are doing something that God does not want you to do. But if you are adorning yourself in modest ways in order to please the master and not please the ruler of the darkness of this age, then you are doing something that God does want you to do. Now the question becomes this, because we know that the Bible speaks time and time again, we're going to get into more scriptures about the sinfulness of immodesty. But the question becomes, how do we restore someone who dresses immodestly? Because if modesty... If immodesty is a sin, then how do we restore that person back to the Lord? Well, Galatians chapter 6, beginning there in verse 1 and also in verse 2, provide a great characteristic and a great attitude for us to have as Christians in every single situation. Because Paul says, you being spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, 
but consider yourself lest you also be tempted. So when it comes to any sin that we are restoring somebody back to the Lord from, it's important that we approach them with the spirit of meekness, with the spirit of humility, recognize that we are a sinner. I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm a sinner just like you. You know, it's been said that a sermon cannot affect the lives of the hearers unless it first affects the life of the preacher. I agree with that. I'm a sinner just like you. I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm just simply saying that we have to hold each other accountable to the standard of God. Because if we as Christians don't hold each other to the accountable, to the standard that God has provided us, the world certainly is not. And therefore, if we are going to be of God, I need other godly people holding me accountable to the standard that God has set forth for me to live by as New Testament Christian. Line number two. The world says that immodesty is the new and improved trend. Now, Moran and I were walking through the mall the other day, and we were looking in all these showcases that were located on, on the outside of the stores, and they always had those outfits that are showcased in those glass boxes because they're wanting to draw your attention to them so that you will buy them. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I found one single outfit in those showcases on the outside of those stores in the mall that the Bible, not myself, that the Bible would consider something that would be modest apparel. It kind of reminds you of that story that we sometimes read, that story about the emperor's new clothes. It was written by a man by the name of Hans Christian Andersen. This man wrote a story about an emperor that was so obsessed with clothing and fine fabric that he was willing to do whatever it took for him to have the finest clothing in the land. Well, one day, some people came to him and they say, we've got the perfect garment for you. It is absolutely perfect for you. No one else has it. You can be the first to have it. And only those who see true beauty can see this garment. Well, what was the problem in that story? Well, the problem was there was no garment at all. And so the Bible tells us, that we are to adorn our bodies in godly ways. But in that story, we find a quote. And the quote comes from a child that notices this emperor and his clothing. And the quote says this. Okay, I must have cut the quote. But the quote says this. that The children are sitting around there and the, there's a public watching this emperor stroll down the street. And the quote says this. He has nothing on at all, the child said. So then an adult hears the child and the adult repeats what the child said and then another adult repeats what the child says. Before long, all these adults that are watching this emperor who has no clothing on at all, all say he has nothing on at all. Now you take that into account with the attitude that exists in our world today. Not only is it the adults who are dressed immodestly, sometimes it's flipped and it's the innocence of the child that is dressed immodestly. Now Peter was considered in an immodest dress in John 21st chapter. In fact, the question that we need to ask is this. When the Bible speaks of nakedness, does the Bible always speak of somebody who is completely nude who has no clothing on at all? Or does the Bible also speak of somebody who's dressed in an immodest dress? Well, in John the 21st chapter, we see the apostle Peter. He's fishing, and as he's fishing, the voice of the Lord comes from the shore. And the voice of the Lord comes from the shore, and they say, it's Jesus who's speaking, it's Jesus, it's the Lord. So Peter, he has on his undergarments, the Bible says. He had taken off his outer garments. Well, as soon as Peter finds out that it's the Lord, what's he do? Well, the Bible says he goes and he finds his outer garments and he puts them back on. Now, let me ask you a question. Why? I mean, after all, Peter had a little bit of clothing on. Why would he go and get his outer garments and put those on? Well, the Bible says, for he was naked. He had a little clothing on, but he was still considered naked. In other words, he was dressed immodestly. Now, the principle is this. There are a lot of people in the world today who do not bat an eye to immodesty. In fact, some even post pictures of themselves in immodest dresses. But never should we ever wear anything that we would not want the Lord to see. Peter was cautious and Peter put on clothing because he didn't want Jesus to see his nakedness. And so he clothed himself in his outer garment. What about Noah in Genesis, the ninth chapter? 
In Genesis chapter 9, beginning there in verse 21, the Bible tells us that Noah gets off the ark. I mean, God has just saved the family of Noah through the humble obedience of Noah. And the first thing that he does once he gets off the ark is what? He goes and he gets drunk. And after he goes and he gets drunk, he goes into a tent. And the Bible tells us that he exposes his nakedness in John, or Genesis chapter 9 and in verse 21. In fact, his son, Ham, walks in on his father, Noah, exposing his nakedness. And what does Ham fail to do? Well, he fails to act. In fact, instead of clothing his father modestly, he just walks out of the tent and he goes and tells others about what his father is doing. Well, then his other two sons... Shem and Japheth come in and they see their father naked. And so they take steps in order to clothe his nakedness and they don't do what Ham did. But the principle that we find within that scripture is this. Canaan or Ham was cursed above all of his brothers. In fact, he was going to be the servant of his brothers. And if we see someone exposing their nakedness by dressing immodestly or living in an immodest way, then we have a responsibility to speak up. Because we share in their sin, we share in their shamefulness, we share in what they are doing if we don't. And we will receive a punishment. Now, this is important. Let's not let immodesty, whether it be of dress or whether it be manner of life, grow roots in our children. Does the Bible provide us an example of God-given clothing? Well, it does in Exodus chapter 28 and verse 42. Now, God is speaking to Moses and he's instructing Moses about how he wants these priests to dress. And this is what he says about the priests. He says, I want them to wear linen breeches. But notice the specific requirements that are listed with the linen breeches. He says, I want them to go from the loin region all the way down to the knee. Now, some people ask the question, well, how long is long and how short is short? And there's your answer. And he's instructing how the priests are to dress. Now, wait a second. If we go over to the New Testament and we read about New Testament Christians within the New Testament, what does the Bible refer to us as in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 and 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9? Well, it refers to us as a royal priesthood, a holy nation that we are priests that have been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. But you know, some people in the world, they dress as if they have not been called out of darkness, but rather are living in darkness. And what about Genesis chapter 3, beginning there in verse 7? We talked about this example last Sunday evening. But in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, we see that Eve eats of the apple and so does Adam. They finally recognize that they're naked. And the Bible tells us in verse 7 that they make for themselves tunics. They make for themselves loincloths, the Bible tells us. And those loincloths, the word for that simple piece of clothing, meant a piece of clothing that only covered the loin region. We would consider that as immodest, at least some people would today. But they dress themselves in an immodest way. Well, go on down to verse 10, the Bible tells us, that the Lord comes walking through the garden in the cool of the day. And as he's walking through the garden in the cool of the day, the Bible tells us that he calls out to Adam. And Adam says, I hid. Why? I hid because I was naked. Now, wait a second. He had on loincloths. He wasn't naked. He wasn't completely nude. Yet Adam said, I was naked. You go on down to verse 21, the Bible tells us that God clothed them in tunics. Now the word tunic simply means a garment that covers the shoulder all the way down to the knees. In fact, it's the same word that's used to describe Joseph's coat of many colors. It was a garment, an overcoat that covered all the way down and God dressed them in a modest fashion. Now this is important. If we are allowing the trend of immodesty to be trend in our lives, then we are not playing part in God's will, but rather we're playing part in a sinful culture. And modesty is our priorities externalized. And we are showing where our priorities are. Number three, the world says that we should live showy and not holy. The world tells you you should show off what the Lord gave you. Now this can apply to two various aspects of modesty within the Word of God. We know that it means dress, but we also know that it means manner of life. Now these lyrics came from a popular country song, and I want to read them for you for just a second. 
The song says this. Don't even want the attention, but yeah, that's all she's getting. Her song is on and she's spinning around. Yeah, she got me drunk like Corona and heart racing like Daytona. Oh, I am in heaven. Look what God gave her. Now, those lyrics were written by a man who actually grew up in the church but has since fallen away from the church. But I think those words really sum up, if you will, the problem of modesty within the culture in which we live. And sometimes we neglect to teach the principle that, yes, it has to do with dress, but it also has to do with manner of life. Now, I want you to notice with me two separate principles as we close in regard to this topic. The first is this. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve were naked. But the Bible also tells us that they were not ashamed... And this takes place in the context of God performing the very first marital ceremony where He weds Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They knew not the difference between good and evil. But you know, in that one verse, it gives us the sphere for nakedness. And that is the marital relationship. Your husband is the only one who has the right to see your body. And your wife is the only one who has the right to see your body. Your body was not meant to see by the person who sees your immodest pictures on social media, your immodest dancing on social media, the person who sees your immodest dress at school or at work, wherever you go. It's not meant for them. It's meant for your spouse. But the second principle is this. We must live modest lifestyles. How can we live modestly in an immodest world? Well, we've got to begin with godliness. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning there in verses 9 and 10, the Bible tells us that Paul calls out modesty. In other words, the gaudiness or the showiness of clothing. It appears that these brethren in this worship service were making this into a fashion show. And he says, this is not what we're trying to do. He says, we are to live modest lives. Now it's not saying that braided hair or gold or pearls or any of those things are sinful. Just as Peter is not saying in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 3 through 4 that the adorning of the outward body and clothing is sinful. Clearly we're supposed to wear clothing. But what he is saying is this. The moment that the outward adorning becomes more important than the inward adorning, then we have crossed that line. In Matthew chapter 11 Jesus talks about John the baptizer. John the baptizer is sent to him and he says, Are you the Christ or do we look for someone else? And Jesus responds there in verse 7 and he says, What did you expect to see with John the baptizer? Did you expect to see soft clothing such as you would find in the king's house? Why would he say something like that? Well, if you go over to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 4, the Bible tells us that John wore camel's hair, which was the fabric of the common man that John wore a big black belt around his waist, and that he also ate locusts and honey. This man was the embodiment of a common man. He was the embodiment of a man who lived a modest lifestyle. And so was our Savior. Here is a king. A king that is born in a manger, literally a feeding trough. A king who literally grew up and was poor. Jesus would say that birds had their nests, but sometimes the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to rest his head. It's not saying that we should live in poverty, but it's simply saying that we should live as our Savior lived. And that is we should live modestly. Now I want to close with this. You know, the story of David and Bathsheba show us the progressive steps that can take hold in the heart of an individual toward sin that are brought about by immodesty. And it also shows us the greater problem. That lust is a temptation, not only for men, that lust is also a temptation for a woman. And sometimes we fail. That includes elders in the Lord's church, deacons, preachers, Sunday school teachers. And when we are choosing to live godly lives, let's always remember to hold each other accountable, to live by the standard that God has provided us so that we can live holy lives, not showy lives, so that we can recognize that beauty is on the inside and not merely on the outside, and so that we can recognize that God has called us to be of Him and not of the world. You know, 
the preacher wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and in verse 14. This is the whole of man. Fear God and keep His commandments. What a wonderful world we would live in if everyone feared God and kept His commandments. If you're here this morning and you're not a New Testament Christian, perhaps you have yet to put on Christ in baptism, to have your sins washed away. You know, the opportunity has arisen here this morning for you to be able to make that decision for yourself. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. The Bible tells us that we must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Romans chapter 10, but also John chapter 8 and verse 24. The Bible tells us that we must confess the name of Jesus before men, Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33. And the Ethiopian eunuch made that confession before he was baptized in Acts chapter 8, the Bible tells us. But the Bible also reminds us that repentance and baptism are essential to the plan of salvation. It was Peter who said in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, repent and be baptized. They cannot be separated because they're joined by that word and. If you're going to become a Christian to have your sins washed away, you must repent of your past sins. Make the decision to put on Christ in baptism. Don't put it off any longer. Because once you enter into Christ, you become a beneficiary of all those blessings that we read of in Ephesians chapter 1. And in verse 3, it tells us that every single blessing, spiritual blessing, in all the heavenly places exists in Christ Jesus. And you will partake of those blessings. And you must live a faithful life unto Him, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Don't put it off any longer.